In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Pace e buono. Peace and all good. That is the Franciscan salutation and greeting by my eighth day in Assisi. I said it in a way that the nun said, ah, you're getting it. Buono, buono. I had a, uh, my, my men a mentor of mine, a colleague of mine, priest in uh, North Carolina. He, a long time ago, took a pilgrimage to Assisi. And he talked about visiting Francis's tomb, which if you've been there, you know, is underneath the Basilica, the uh, Vatican before there was a Vatican. And the tomb is, um, it's, it's in a room probably like half the size of this. It's obviously dark because it's in the basement of the Basilica. There are rows of um, seats, like pews, not very many, uh, maybe enough to fit 50 people. And then you walk into like a circular area where the tomb is in the center. Have any of you been to Francis's? Um, and you can walk around the whole tomb. And there's Compline is said every night at 10, at 10 p.m. And so my friend was on a tour group. And he went into the tomb. And there were other people there that weren't part of the tour. And he said, you know, the tour was going along and everything was fine. And he said, kind of out of the corner of his eye, he noticed there was a woman standing there um, taking her clothes off. And he said it was really weird because nobody freaked out. Like the woman was just disrobing and starting to take off her clothes. And they were, everybody was getting a little more uncomfortable. And he said, and then kind of out of nowhere, a priest came up and put his cloak around her or coat. And then just kind of quietly ushered her out. And afterwards, Jonah said to the tour guide, uh, what was up with that? And the tour guide said, I don't know, stuff like that just happens here. And I think one of the reasons it just happens there is because the woman is um, embodying a little bit of the story of Francis. Francis, as I'm sure you know, uh, was born into a very wealthy family. His dad was a fabric merchant, and they were upper middle class, which is uh, the fruits Francis enjoyed very much in his youth. He was known for his carousing and rebel rousing and, and spending his, his dad's hard-earned fortune. And then there was a civil war that broke out in Umbria in that region, and Francis went to be a soldier, and he was captured and his dad was extorted, basically. His dad had to pay a huge sum of money for Francis to return home. And Francis had been injured, and so he coalesced for about two years. And in the course of that time, as is true in our Christian history with other soldiers, he discerned a new, the beginnings of a new calling in his life to serve God and the church. And one day he was praying in uh, San Damiano, which is still there. It eventually became the home of the poor, frere, poor Clares, uh, St. Clare, who followed Francis. Um, and he was in San Damiano, which was kind of a, a mess at the time, when he heard the voice of God tell him to rebuild my church, which in that moment he took very literally. And what do you need in order to rebuild the church? Um, you need a capital campaign, or you just need some cash uh, right then and there. So what did Francis do? He went and stole two bolts of cloth from his dad's storehouse and sold it, got a bag of gold, and went right to the priest at San Damiano and says, here, I want to rebuild this church. And the priest was like, no, 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 no. He didn't want the wrath of uh, Pietro Bernardino, which is Francis's dad, he didn't want his wrath upon him. And he's like, this is not how we rebuild a church. And um, you need to go to the bishop, because they were actually afraid of Francis's dad, you know, get, taking it out on them. So the priest brings Francis to uh, Bishop Guido, and you can still go to that courtyard in Assisi. And his father comes, along with lots of people, because they're going to basically do a trial of Francis. And um, the bishop explains to Francis, God doesn't want your ill-gotten gains. That's of no use to God. And he says, my son, have confidence in the Lord and act courageously. And God will help you and give you everything that is necessary. 
not everything you need, but everything that is necessary. And apparently this struck Francis's heart, and so he took the bag of gold, he handed it to his father, and he took off all his clothes and handed those to his father and said, naked before God and all the gathered, I can now with true freedom pray, our Father who art in heaven. Pietro is no longer my father. And with that radical act of embodying what he now believed, Francis lived a life in radical solidarity with poverty and all people, with every creature and with all creation. He never wore shoes because he always wanted to walk on Mother Earth because he had an awakening of finally seeing that God was in every one and everything. Later this week, I'm starting a book discussion of a book called The Universal Christ, which was written by Richard Rohr, who is a Franciscan and a priest and an author and an all-around saint of our time. Well, we're all saints, by the way. Saint of our time. And um, this book is sort of his summa theologica. It's his sort of final statement on, he's like, this is all I can say. And as you might take it from the title, The Universal Christ, the thesis of the book is that everything and everyone belongs. And the whole point of Christ is that Christ is a word, it is a blueprint that has been with us from the beginning. The first Bible is creation, the Big Bang. God has never not been speaking to us, but has always been revealing God's self in a never-ending outpouring of manifestations of the divine. Jesus, in a particular point in history, is a person and the Son of God who understood this, and we are called to follow the pattern of Jesus' life, which is radical solidarity with everyone and everything. Because the only thing Jesus excludes is exclusion itself. So this worldview, Roar says, you got to understand that all of us, at all different times in our life, have specific worldviews, specific biases by which we see our world, right? We don't see things as they are. We see things as we are. We know that, right? So he says there are basically four worldviews. There's the material worldview. It's the sort of thing that you say, like, here we are in church, but what really matters is what happens in the real world, right? The real world is the material worldview. It's the world of things and stuff, and there's many good things. These aren't value judgments. There's many good things that come in the material world. Medicine, science, engineering, buildings. We need the material world. But taken to its extreme, it is purely economies of merit and money, no economy of grace. It is hierarchical, and it operates with an idea of scarcity, that there is not enough, because it doesn't see in abundance. It sees only material good. Then you have the spiritual worldview. Nothing in the real world matters. The things that matter are of the spirit, the things you can't see. This is the basis of religions and philosophies, and there may be a god or gods or a platonic immovable mover, but it's a disembodied way of being that's all about thinking, which means there's no room for creation or creatures, and if you can't think, then obviously this spiritual way of being isn't available to you. Then the third worldview, notice the pun, is the priestly worldview. These people who have a slightly more evolved consciousness, <laughs> I'll get to making fun of myself, because they understand that the point of life is to bridge and connect the spiritual and the material, and they feel it's their calling, not just priests, 
but people who have a calling to connect these two worlds. Now, the challenge with that is that separating them in the first place and creating um, a dialectical problem. And also the problem with that is that the ego can get in the way. And those of us with the priestly worldview can think we have all the answers since we are the people who hold the codes and the law and the traditions and the rituals. This is exactly why Jesus starts to pray in this Gospel of Matthew. He is standing there surrounded by the Pharisees who are getting mad at some people for not doing the rituals the right way. And Jesus says, oh my gosh, thank you, God, that you have revealed this stuff not to the wise and the intelligent, but to the infants. The infants have the ultimate understanding that God is in everything and everyone all the time. And so the premise of this book, which is a very Franciscan premise, is that we are to lead lives with an incarnational worldview, seeing God in everything and in everyone all the time, aware of when these other biases and worldviews separate us or cause us to exclude people from being a part of God's human created family. Rohr says that when you are experiencing the incarnational worldview, something or someone has pulled you out of yourself. And so you see eternally, even if it's just for a moment. And I know everyone here has had that experience. We tend to have it in periods of great love and great suffering. They are those things that are spoken of in all traditions that we simply know, as Laura says, with our Christian common sense. We just know them to be true. It's why Paul in this letter says, those rituals don't matter. This is about a new creation. It's why every story in the Old Testament and the New involves a person seeing in a whole new way, from Elijah on a mountain where he sleeps and then wakes up and goes, God, you were here all the time. This is the place where heaven meets the earth. The same rock that it was in the night before, but now he sees in a new way, or when Paul has the scales fall from his eyes, and then he sees that it's all about being in Christ. Do you notice Paul never quotes Jesus? Nowhere. In Paul's letters, does he actually quote the words of Jesus? He just talks about being in Christ. And Paul talks about boasting in the cross because the cross is not a sign of divine judgment, but of divine solidarity with humanity and the suffering of this world and always seeking to redeem it. So... May we be people who have an incarnational worldview. This is why we bring animals into church once a year. Because that does pull us out of ourselves in this brief way as a community to understand that God is in these creatures of creation just as God is in us. It does pull children more front and center in our worship, which helps us understand that all of these things are given to the infants, and let the little children come to me. When Francis died on October 4th, 1226, he said he welcomed Sister Death, and he laid down on the floor of his hut, and he looked up at his brothers and said, Christ has shown me what I ought to do. May Christ show you what you ought to do. Pace e buono. Amen. Let us reaffirm our faith in the one God as we say together the Nicene Creed. 